Hey guys, welcome back to What's Up Grimes. My name is Jen and I'm sitting here with MK as usual. Hey MK. Hello. So we're back. MK and I recorded Thursday morning and we're pretty happy to be back on an evening schedule. Yes. And we are here today thrilled to be talking to Nathan Green. Nathan is an Ontario-based science fiction author, pilot, and practicing corporate lawyer. So welcome, Nathan. And will you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, uh, thank you for having me on the show. This is fantastic. Oh. So uh, yeah, as as you said, I, I mean, I wear a bunch of hats. Um, I'm uh, I'm a corporate lawyer, so that means you know I'm setting up businesses, helping people structure things, helping people finance their businesses. Um, you know, that's my that's my kind of day job, or as I like to say, my afternoon job. But uh, <laughs> in the mornings, uh, I, I get up real early and I'm I'm writing science fiction, and I've been doing that for the last uh, two years now. Yeah. And while we're fascinated by that, we're going to get to that in a minute. Let's talk a little bit about the afternoon job that you do. What came first, the aerospace engineering, the corporate lawyering? What came first? How did that come about? Piloting? Yeah. Uh, the, well, yeah, the piloting came first of all, actually. So um, when I was uh, 12 years old, I joined uh, the Air Cadets, which is a uh, uh, a Canadian organization for like little, little kids. I I think in the U.S. you've got something called the Civil Air Patrol, yes. which is like the equivalent. Yeah, boy, it's been a long time since I accessed that memory. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so uh, at uh, at 16, I got my glider's license through the Air Cadets. And at 17, I got my powered pilot's private license. Um, and uh, then I went off to uh, university. And I was always like a really kind of science-oriented kid. Uh, I, I took every science course I could in high school. And... Uh, Aerospace engineering just made sense. I, I loved planes. I loved, you know, I loved math. Uh, you know, no brainer, right? Uh, so uh, four years later, I, I graduated with a degree in aerospace engineering, and I, I did quite well in it. I graduated with honors. It was it was fantastic. I really liked it. Um, and I went I went out there looking for work, and uh, so I, I got this job uh, after after quite a long uh, job hunt. They, you know, it was it was kind of hard being a junior like or a brand new you know engineer or you're not even an engineer at that point you're like an engineer in training yeah um but uh I, I you know when i graduated the job market in ontario wasn't fantastic uh and so after you know about six months looking for work i got a job at um a crane company that makes these truck mounted knuckle boom cranes and it's they're really cool trains like they unfurl from the back of the truck and they lift materials all over the place um and i was doing weight and balance calculations for them and um I was kind of saying to myself, look, this is this is simple work like this is not, um, you know, what I needed, like what I, you know, my, my degree, you know, we're in first year still at this point, you know, when when do I get to the next few years? And I was kind of talking to my friends. I was looking around and I was saying to myself, you know, the first like long time in engineering, it's like it's really kind of simple, basic stuff where, you know, if you want to learn all about a bolt and it can be a very important bolt, like it can be a bolt that saves people's lives and is as big as your wrist. Um, but like, you know, you can do that for years. Uh, and it, it was it was too kind of focused, too small picture for me. Uh, and so kind of on a lark, I wrote the LSAT. Uh, and I did I did well at the LSAT. And so I said, well, you know, OK, I'll apply to I'll apply to some law schools and see what comes of it. And I got accepted to some law schools. So um, I, I thought I was making a big mistake. Like I, I, I said to myself, you know, this could this could well be the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. And you get like one of those. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I quit my job. Uh, I, I started law school and right away I knew it was for me. Like the first week of law school, it was like, yes, this is this is awesome. This is amazing. <laughs> it's it's big picture. It's challenging thinking. It's it's thinking very logically in a critical way um, and being able to separate out like kind of competing ideas that might seem similar, but, but you know, it's, it's total red herrings. Uh, and so I loved it, but I had a problem. And the problem was I was, you know, I had a degree in aerospace engineering and I did not have to write an essay to get a degree in aerospace engineering. I had to solve differential equations. I had to do all sorts of math. I had to, you know, like write reports. I had to draw an AutoCAD, like all of that. I did not have to write a sentence. 
And in law school, your entire grading scheme is based on essays. The exams are essays, the, the assignments are essays, it's essays. And I couldn't write for beans. So um, I, did, I did well in law school. I got a top quarter of my class without being able to write. Uh, and so I started writing fiction just as a way of practicing, where wow. I, I was just saying, you know, yeah, I, I need to write every day if I'm going to get good at this. And it's my, my writing is embarrassing as is. Um, so uh, <laughs> I, I started writing and uh, fast forward a decade and I was actually getting good at writing. And do you know how to ski? Like, are you guys skiers at all? Yeah. I can imagine skiing, but I've been once. <laughs> yeah, does that count? Okay. <laughs> uh, like, as near as I can figure, like, I, I have the experience with writing where it was like skiing, um, where when I was skiing as a kid, like, I just started to feel eventually like I had control over myself and where my body was going on the hill. And, like, you just started to feel more and more. Like, and bef before it was all this wild rush of, like, sensations and, you know, oh, my God, and now I'm going in directions I don't want. But then, you know, like bit by bit, it felt like you were getting a handle on it. It felt like, you know, I was, uh, I, I kind of was organizing myself. And yeah. that's what writing started to feel like, where, you know, I just make these steps and I, I came to have a better and better control of what I was doing and, and started to understand what I was doing. And um, so 2020 hit, COVID hit, mm -hmm. we were all kind of stuck in that. And uh, I was saying to myself, you know, gee, what do I want to be doing? Uh, I, I had this firm job that I'd been with for a long time, very stable, very good job. And, you know, I, I wasn't particularly happy though. And I, I said, you know, look, if I'm ever going to take some time and actually write, now's the time. Uh, and so I told the firm, you know, look, I, I need to take some time. Uh, and, uh, they said, well, you know, Nathan, you've got a bunch of files and a bunch of clients and we don't know them. Like they're, they're your clients. Uh, do you want to take them with you? And so you can have something to do, you know, while you're, wow. while you're busy, you know, chasing a dream. Uh, and I said, well, you know, it's hard to pass it when pass that down. So, right. uh, I wound up with like a half a practice. So mm -hmm. in the afternoon I practice law. And in the morning, I get up at 5 a.m. and I, I go out of the house and I, I write until, you know, 10 or so. And I get, you know, and it's so it's been fantastic. It, wow. Yeah, it sounds to me very much like you're somebody who needs to be intellectually stimulated. And without that, you feel like something's missing. And that sounds like the transition from the engineering to the law to the writing, which I, yeah. I love. Yeah, it felt like a yeah. very natural progression into it like I, I did not see that one coming <laughs> right so you know I, I've been saying this whole time like I've got that credit for one major life mistake and I, I didn't make it when I left engineering to go to law school and um, you know maybe I cashed it in you know to, to start writing uh, the, the jury's still out on that one but I know that I um, I've gotten a lot better at writing in the last couple of years and I've um, I've really kind of feel like I've accomplished this skill, which is something that eluded me my whole life. You know, like I had a very hard time learning to uh, learning to read and write as a child, like a, a small child. And that's probably one of the reasons I was so interested in uh, in maths and science, because they just they worked for my brain better. Uh, and and now I now I can write and I can write competently. That's amazing. Yeah. So when you get up in the morning at 5 a.m., and you're, you're, you're ready to go. Do you, where do you go? Yeah. Uh, I, I go out and sit in a park. I've, I oh. found a beautiful park and <laughs> I've, I've got my laptop and I have no internet. I leave my cell phone behind cause I don't like the distractions and I, you know, I've got absolutely no way to access the rest of the world for, you know, five hours. And all I, all I do is just write and it, it's fantastic. It works well for me. Wow. And five days a week or more. Seven, seven days a week. Wow. It's become a ritual, your day-to-day yeah. -day ritual. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, I, I they always say, like, have a have a consistent sleep cycle. Mm -hmm. And, like, yeah. you know, I never believed that. And that was, like, that was, like, a joke while you're practicing law in a firm. You, mm -hmm. you do not have a consistent sleep cycle. Good luck. It will mm -hmm. not happen. Um, now, though, I, I actually have one. And, uh, yeah, when, once you're used to getting up at 5 a.m., you can't sleep in even till 7 mm -hmm. a.m. Like, it's... 
you know, and, and if you're not like dreading waking up in the morning, it makes it easier as well. Yeah. There's nothing like a blank page staring at you, you know, like, is there, were there prompts that you used initially to kind of start your skill set with it? Or did you just free flow? Yeah, no, I've, I've never had that bank blank page problem. Um, wow. Yeah. I, I, you know, and I don't, I don't like, I like, I don't like look down my nose at people who do like, that's totally understandable. Like I can yeah. get what, what the problems are there. Um, it's, um, yeah, it's just, it, it, it's, you know, not, it's not one of the issues I face. Like everyone's got different issues with writing <laughs> and I have issues, like I've got issues with my writing, but that particular one I've managed to avoid. Wow. That's incredible. So when you start writing at 5 a.m. and it's a new idea, do you start just where you think of first and build around that? Or do you start right at the beginning of the story? So uh, <clears throat> one of the one of the lessons and one of the things like I learned with like the skiing analogy where I'm gaining control. When I first started writing, I'd write myself into corners a lot where I had like I've got a bunch of manuscripts. <clears throat> you get like 40,000 words in and it's just not working and the plot's a mess. And, you know, what are you supposed to do with this? Um, and as I, as I got better at it, I, you know, found techniques that worked for me to avoid that. And so now I've got an outlining method that works very well for me. So now what I start with is like a hook, uh, like an idea that like, okay, this is going to be what's going to center the plot. And this is what's going to like, you know, pitch right away and pitch well, uh, so that I can then, you know, you know, th then I start expanding on it and building around like, okay, so what do I need to do to expand on this? on this pitch. Um, yeah, that's amazing. So always science fiction. Has it ever gone into other genres or do you always stay within that realm typically? Treason's Temple, which is a book I put out last year, uh, is more fantasy than it is science fiction. It, it very much feels like fantasy. Mm -hmm. uh, it was always kind of meant as science fiction, but um, like it was, it was kind of meant to be the first book in a trilogy. And by the time you get to the third book in the trilogy, you're going, oh my gosh, this is science fiction. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the first book is, is very much feels like fantasy. And I've, I've had ideas like that where, you know, you could play with uh, fantasy. One of the, one of the ideas I, I had, and I, I spent a lot of time um, trying to figure out a way to do it, but it didn't work, uh, was this story where, um, a guy is like riding on a dragon with a sword and he's fighting other people riding on a dragon with a sword. And, you know, he falls off his dragon and he bumps his head and he kind of wakes up and like, oh, what's going on? And uh, he comes to realize like, oh, I've got all like this cool stuff. And like, I've got like this armor, I've got this sword, I've got these skills with this dragon that I don't remember learning, but like now I'm kind of seeing I have and I'm coming back to it. And he starts kind of realizing like, this feels kind of scripted. Like this feels like this all fits together too neatly. Why is it that like, <clears throat> why is it that like I'm upgrading my weapons? Like that doesn't seem right to me. Like shouldn't, shouldn't we all just go to the blacksmith and buy a really great weapon right away? Like, why is it that, you know, like you look, you show me my progression of weapons and I had the little weed knife and then this one and then <laughs> this one and then the big one. And now like the, the jewel encrusted, you know, dragon slayer blade. And, um, <clears throat> he realizes that, you know, he, or he eventually realizes he's in like a far distant future where people choose the life they want to live, the fantasy they want to spend their lives playing out. And then they kind of lose their memory of making that choice. So he, he at some point as a child, he chose that I want to, you know, I want to be a dragon rider. And that's the, that's the experience I want to have with existence. Um, and I never found a way to make that into a story. Uh, but yeah. like, it's this, like, it's this nugget of an idea where you go like, oh, okay, you know, gee, what if you could pick the perfect life for yourself? What would it be? Right. And then, so then I expand on it and build. If I had to guess, you rely a lot on your logical scientific brain to kind of figure out the logistics of the, the fantasy worlds. Yeah, I try to. And, and this, the sci-fi stuff, but that makes it hard to do characters. So characters are something that I really have to put a deliberate effort into some people they're fantastic for characters it's natural yeah. it's smooth um 
for me, it's like, okay, look, I gotta, I gotta work at this. I gotta do it ten times. I gotta make sure I, I feel it. Yeah, and I, I, I want to go more into your novels, but first, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, generally speaking, why sci-fi? Because for those that aren't <laughs> as invested in sci-fi, sci-fi stands for science fiction. It's a form of fiction that deals principally with the impact of actual or imagined science upon society and individuals. It was first popular popularized back in the 1920s and became wildly popular in the 1950s. So Nathan, can you tell us why sci-fi hits home for you? So there are some people uh, for whom ideas are like candy. And I'm that kind of person where ideas are just kind of candy for me. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, so, you know, I love playing with ideas. And you, you tell me something interesting and like, oh, wow, that's, that's rewarding for my brain. Like I just get a little, like a little ding when that goes off. Um, and everyone's going to be a little bit different this way and the different kinds of ideas that they're going to enjoy are, are going to vary. Um, like I think the big difference between hard science fiction and soft science fiction is in hard science fiction, like you love to hear about like technical details, like, you know, like in, in a 10 warthogs cannon can only fire for five seconds before the thrust of the bullets is, is enough to overpower the forward thrust of the jet engines. Like, Oh yeah, that's fantastic, right? Oh, like yeah. that's kind of the hard science fiction candy. And the soft yeah. science fiction candy is like the social sciences where like, here's an interesting idea in social sciences. Like, oh yeah, 1% uh, of US births are claimed to be virgin births. Yeah. 1%, no, no, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's like the different kind of candy you enjoy, I think. Wow. So are there, you said as a kid it was a bit difficult to to re to get through reading and um are there any particular sci-fi or fantasy authors or like comic book writers that inspired you or were you inspired a lot by film like science fiction film um i i remember like as a a teenager like you know 14 or something like that like a little teenager um, spending a lot of time in the school library reading like these old trashy science fiction novels they had stacked in there like, <laughs> yeah. and they were all like <laughs> like that's where I read iRobot uh, I, I, I read some stuff I was I was looking for what's the most obscure science fiction book I ever read I found something that wasn't even on Goodreads like I, you know so, <laughs> and it's sitting on my shelf like so you yeah. know just like this old trashy sci-fi I um, love it but you know yeah there was you know there were a lot of movies there were a lot of television shows um some sometimes there was like a little bit of overlap like i read the book starship troopers mm -hmm. because the movie was coming out and it was r-rated and i was too young to go see the r-rated <laughs> movie so, <laughs> so so my only alternative was to read the book oh my god that's so funny Sorry um, to interrupt not, uh, here, MK. I'm so sorry, but I, one oh. of the things that Nathan and I were messaging about is obviously we're a Grimes podcast, and so Grimes is heavily inspired by Dune. And I reached out to Nathan uh, via email, and I was like, "Have you read Dune?" And I think Nathan, you were expecting that I was going to be like, "That's what we need to talk about on the podcast," but we both ended up having a discussion about how it's it's kind of a hard read. Yeah. Um, so you inspired me to make another stab at Doom. But before this, I'd probably tried three or four times and I'd always kind of tapered out. Um, I think, you know, I, I think I, I stopped reading it twice at the, the shield fight scene in the first couple of chapters. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, th you know, this time I'm like halfway through and I'm enjoying it a lot more. Um, I, I don't know. I don't really know what my problem with it was that time. Although I did the same thing with Lord of the Rings, where it took me yeah. like five or six attempts to get through Lord of the Rings, and it was just that first yeah. chapter. They are so similar in their ability to make me not want to finish them, like both books. I don't know what it is, and I love science fiction, fantasy, all about it. It's like all day long, but those two are just so i don't know if it's the density mm -hmm. or or what but the world's constructed and the languages like there's a it's almost it is like kind of like game of thrones like it's a whole universe world but there's just something about it that's hard to to digest yeah so i i mean if i was to take a guess on on both books it's that they've both got a slow start where you don't really know what the what the point of the book is or why we care about any right. of this stuff for, yep. for quite a while. Um, 
And uh, this is something like I'd, I'd known and I'd heard is like an issue that you have to pay attention to with writing. Uh, and I think it's one of the problems with Treason's Temple, actually, where mm -hmm. I assumed that I, I might have, you know, 80, 100 pages or something like that before, you know, the real inciting event happens. Uh, and when, uh, you know, you look at the, the Amazon statistics for, you know, how far people actually go, uh, it's like, oh, 15, 16 pages. And, and if you look at something like The Hunger Games, wow, you, you get sold on that right away. Like, I think it's like mm -hmm. 15 or 16 pages in, mm -hmm. and then her sister's called up for the games and you're like, oh my right. God, you know? Uh, so yeah, like for the modern audience, uh, Dune and uh, Lord of the Rings, they have a slow opening. You gotta, you know, you gotta know it's gonna get good. Yeah, it's the same with the movies too. I feel, and both Dune movies, and I love David Lynch more than anything. And I could not get into either movie. I don't know. I, I still haven't been able to watch the 84 movie all the way through. Oh, like, no. I, I, yeah, I fall asleep. I try. Oh, no. <laughs> it's Sorry, so bad. Lynch. The, the first, like, I don't know, the first opening scene for me is, like, cringeworthy. But somebody's going to be mad at me for saying that in this audience. But it's not for me. We're sorry. <laughs> so back to your work. Do you, was the first book you wrote, My Late Life, was that the first one you wrote? Or is that the first one you published? What is the order in which you wrote them? And is it aligned yeah. with the publications? No, not really. Uh, well, or a little bit. I, I, so the Galileo was the first the first one I, I wrote and intended to put out there. Um, then Treason's Temple, then My Late Life, which is a novella. Uh, and and by the way, like My Late Life is not science fiction. My Late Life is right. um, it, it, my Late Life is a little weird. It's a novella. It was it was um, you know like I said I struggle with characters. Uh, and so I wanted to do a voice exercise. And so I, I asked myself, well, whose voice do I think I could, you know, do well? And I said, well, Winston Churchill. I know, I know what Winston Churchill sounds like when he's talking. Let me just try to, you know, make a character sound like Winston Churchill. So yeah. I imagined uh, Winston Churchill wakes up in his bed one morning. He's passed away. He is now a ghost and he's got to solve a murder in the real world. Uh, so, you know, and I spend, you know, I spend, you know, 20,000 words, you know, as Winston Churchill Peter and around the real world trying to solve a murder. He's naked, right? <laughs> naked. Well, at the start, at the start, he he finds a way to get some clothes. <laughs> it's so funny. Uh, it's such a creative idea. I love that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It kind of reminds me, have you ever seen the British? Well, there's an American version too of the show Ghosts. And one of the ghosts it was uh, in, the, in the British version. He was a politician and he passed away without pants on. So he's only wearing a suit top and a blazer and he, his shirt is, is just long enough to cover up everything, but he died with no pants on. So I thought that was funny. I love that. I love that. I, I mean, for for me, the reason I, I chose to make Churchill a ghost was um, I wanted to take away all his power because um, he's such an imposing figure. And I think, you know, people are more interesting when they're, you know, they're not overpowered within a story. Uh, and uh, I thought it would be a, a real uh, evocative problem for him to have as a ghost, the, the fact that he's naked, even though no one can see him. It's, it's just like, you know, no, this bothers me. It offends my dignity. I want my clothes. <laughs> yeah. Like, why am I naked? This is ridiculous. Yeah. It's almost I, comedic, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think actually my late life is pretty funny. Um, yeah. I've, I've, got, I've got some good jokes in there, I think. Yeah. So that's one of the, the books. Tell us about the others that you've written. Um, so there's the Galileo, uh, which was the first one I did. And um, the idea behind the Galileo is um, I was watching um, Star Trek Enterprise. I don't know if you've seen that show. Yes. Oh, yeah. So I was so disappointed with that show when, when I was watching the first season of it because the pitch on it, what it made me think of is like the right stuff in space where I, and I, I don't know if you've seen that movie or read that book, but mm -hmm. the right stuff is like the, you know, man's first, you know, first attempt to, or America's first attempt to get out of, uh, uh, out of our atmosphere and into space. 
and nothing works. Like rockets are blowing up, you know, the people involved have these personality issues, like, you know, some prima donnas and like test pilots and, and um, you can't rely on your technology. So it's, it's a lot of like pushing the unknown and not, you know, and not being, you know, trusting of anything around you. And that's kind of the total opposite of what Star Trek is, because like Star Trek, you know, they, they're totally reliant on their technologies and it always just kind of works. And Star Trek Enterprise, it all still worked. Like, <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, they had kind of things like, <laughs> oh, we've got these brand new phasers and they don't work quite right. And we've got these torpedoes and they kind of go sideways sometimes. But like, you know, really we can still rely on all of our technology. It doesn't represent danger to any of us. But so I was asking myself like, look, the first time we managed to build a ship that can go faster than light and actually send it out there, what it would it be like? And so it'd be unreliable. It'd be horrifically dangerous. It would be a very long trip because let's say, you know, we want to go to a, a star system that's 30 light years away or something like that. We'd launch that mission as soon as it was, as soon as it was possible to put enough food on that ship to get people there alive. So like three years, one way, that's the Galileo. And so then I asked, well, okay, you know, what is three years on a ship going in one direction without stops? do to the crew and who do you have to have as a crew if you're gonna you know get there and find nothing and then go somewhere else and find nothing and then go somewhere else and find nothing or or find something right so you've got this indefinite mission where you know minimum six year round trip but your your plan is just to kind of keep going yeah. so you know young crew inexperienced um doesn't you know doesn't really know what they're doing and is having all sorts of technical problems with the ship around them so that was the idea behind the galileo um and um, then I, I wrote Treason's Temple, which uh, is this kind of quasi fantasy book. And it's uh, about a brother and a sister who find themselves on the wrong side of the royal family of America after democracy has collapsed hundreds of years into the future. And uh, they're, you know, they get thrust into an adventure that, of course, involves some royal intrigue and, you know, questioning what, you know, the underpinnings of the society are. Yeah. And to piggyback off that, Nathan, so we know that science fiction often is is created around scientific and technological developments um, in order to achieve techno-social change. My question for you is pretty random, but if you, as an engineer, are looking at all of our advancements with AI, space travel, whatever it is, what form of advancement are you most excited about that you feel inspires you? Well, I, I actually kind of think those are different, different uh, technologies for me. So like what I'm most excited about, I think, is medical technologies, um, mm. because if you look at um, if you look at what we were doing with metal, you know, like 100 years ago and you, you know, you show someone what we can do with metal today, they'd be blown away. Like it's not at all that like, you know, we you're telling me that we can write like two nanometer strips of of conductors onto onto chips like, no, that's impossible. So it's it's magic. If you, if you go like 100 years into the past, what we can do today is magic when it comes to metal. It's magic what we can do with information like it's this communication inconceivable mm. to someone from a hundred years ago and and yeah. that it's nothing to us and that we would be upset if suddenly the video froze for a few seconds oh this stupid <laughs> computer what <laughs> um but um medical technology hasn't done that yet but it's just kind of starting to where you know if you if you break a bone like okay we're gonna we're gonna put it back in place and we're gonna drill some screws into it with another sheet of metal to hold it in place like it's it's <laughs> It's very primitive and it's totally understandable by people from a hundred years ago. But, you know, tailored, tailored anti-cancer medicine based mm -hmm. on your genome, like that's new, that's amazing. Uh, yeah. So I, I think there's a lot of possibility in the medical field for us in our lifetimes to start seeing stuff that looks like magic and would have been magic to us as children. So that's, that's kind of what I'm most excited um, about. Um, but, you know, what I think, you know, is going to be like, you know, some of the big things we're going to see soon, like AI is coming along. Like, I, I, I don't know when that changes the world, but it's going to change the world. Um, yeah. and, and we're kind of stumbling into it. So <laughs> that's, that's going to be interesting when it happens, but I'm not particularly excited about it. 
Yeah, I'm kind of scared. <laughs> yeah, Nathan, tell us a little bit more about I'm not particularly excited because we know we see people like Elon Musk giving interviews talking about how it's going to come as a danger to people when it's fully advanced. So, so what makes you the most nervous about it? So um, I don't even think it has to so like you know the turing test like mm -hmm. my turing test is will it say no like mm -hmm. you know like when i ask my phone like hey could, could you set an alarm for like six o'clock and it goes no i don't feel like it oh okay well that's that's kind of alive right <laughs> like that's a problem uh but um even even kind of before like it it, it gains a soul or consciousness or whatever you want to call it uh we're going to lose a ton of jobs. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's going to be a bad time. Like yeah, self-driving cars. When you think about the impact of that, just, just on that one technology. So like a quarter, it's some, you know, don't call me on the statistics, but it's something like a quarter of hospital care and admissions healthcare is because of motor vehicle accidents. Mm -hmm. So like, Okay, so like imagine, you know, self-driving cars come out. Okay, you know, all the truckers are out of work, all the cab drivers are out of work, all the bus drivers are out of work, all the delivery guys are out of work. Like we knew about that, but then a quarter of doctors are out of work. Oh, we didn't know about that. And then the cops who just do like traffic work, they're gone. The the lawyers who do like tickets and, and criminal prosecutions from driving offenses, they're gone. Like jails are smaller. And by the way, all of these are good things. Like mm. you can't say that, oh yeah, I wanna keep I wanna keep people employed being prison guards, so let's lock up more people. Like that's not a right. that's not a good thing. But people being out of work is also a bad thing. Uh, and when you when you kind of stack it on top of things and you say like this is just gonna be like one little drip in a bucket of all of these people who are going to be out of work at basically the same time. I'm, I'm very nervous about that. And you don't have to have it be conscious and aware and trying to hurt us or do us wrong to really disrupt our society. What a great yeah. point, because I think about this even with factory jobs being demolished so that robots can come in and do the job and how we celebrate that as an advancement. And it is an advancement in a capitalistic society However, when you think about the people who are laid off, who that was the generational job that they took, that's that's difficult. It is very bittersweet. Yeah, and I, you know, I mean, I don't want a warehouse job, but there are some people who do. Yes, and I and I don't, you know, I, I when I was in university, I worked warehouse jobs. I'm moving boxes around all summer long because you know it was decent money, and you know what else am I going to do for four months? And you know. I, I met people and I was friends with them and like, they liked their jobs. Mm -hmm. And if they lost their job, they wouldn't have known what to do with themselves. Uh, and, and that's a problem for society. Like, you know, you're not going to retrain a warehouse worker to go off and be, you know, a doctor or something like that. Um, you know, there's a, there's a fairly limited number of jobs. And I think they're all kind of in this area where automation is going to come for all of them at the same time. You know, like you're going to call center workers, gone, you know, customer support, gone, like cab drivers, gone, you know, Cashiers. Uber drivers, gone. Cashiers, Cashiers. starting again, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's wild and it's going to hit all at the same time, I think. Well, that's terrifying. <laughs> Everybody's having a great night out there. Thinking about right. Keeping it up positive here. <laughs> Well, we define ourselves by our jobs a lot too, right? Like, um, I, you know, if you look at like Star Trek, the universe of Star Trek, they imagine a world where people are just kind of doing things to give their lives meaning. And, um, you know, that's, that's fantastic, right? And everyone, you know, everyone has that, everyone finds that. But their entire society has been built up around that idea. Like you don't have like 15 year old kids who are looking at the world around them and going like, well, why am I in school? Because like, I get kind of crappy grades. I, I don't want to go to university. I couldn't even if I tried. I'm not going to have a job when I get out of here. Like there's nothing for me to do. My, my dad's unemployed. My mom's unemployed. My uncle's unemployed. My grandfather's unemployed. Like my, my friend's dad's unemployed. My friend's mom's unemployed. Like my older brother's unemployed. Like, so I'm going to be unemployed too. Like, so I, you know, why am I going to school? What am I, what am I doing? 
and he doesn't have that like Star Trek mentality, right? Like he's not, you know, he did the, like that whole social structure for like, oh yeah, listen, you know, you're going to be a great artist. You're going to, you know, learn, you know, some great skill. What is your passion and follow that. And society will provide you the resources for you to do that. Maybe you could be, you know, a world-class skier, you know, like, no, society isn't going to provide you those resources. Not in, not in our society anyways. So I, yeah, I think it's a major problem and I don't know what we're going to do about it. Yeah, and I even think about college right now, getting that bachelor's degree does not mean nearly as much as it did, you know, 10 years ago, for That's example, um, because because of the, the way the job market is changing. And I'm a clinical mental health therapist. And so everybody says, oh, your job is secure. If you look back in time, they created therapy modules on the computer. I want to say it was like back in like the 80s, 90s um, that did a very basic therapeutic skill, which is like one of our most basic skills is reflective listening, right? Like I hear you feel upset because of X, Y, and Z. And the computer could do that for, for the participants. And the participants were like, wow, that actually made me feel better. And whereas I don't see my job getting replaced anytime soon, the fact that they can use those basic reflective listening skills and that somebody gets something out of it says something. Yeah. And, and, you know, like even, even lawyers, I mean, you know, ultimately this is about knowing and applying rules to different, different scenarios. And I don't see anything about that, that an AI couldn't do, um, and couldn't do, you know, faster than I could do it. Like I've, you know, I go look up things up in books all the time and the AI wouldn't be doing that. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't necessarily think there's many jobs that are like totally safe. Yeah, and to to not to to transition to more positive note. <laughs> Sorry. Do you want to talk about your do you excuse me, Do you want to talk about your latest uh, upcoming release on December first? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's a book called Woe to the Victor. And, uh, y you know, eh, we're hoping to turn this positive. <laughs> the book starts five minutes after the world's been destroyed and everyone's dead, um, except, you know, a Wonderful. handful of survivors. Right. So it's it's not like post-apocalyptic. It's like apocalyptic. But it just starts a couple of minutes after the apocalypse hits. So alien invaders have destroyed the world. And it's about like the last remnants of the human military and uh, the the attempt to find survival in uh, a hostile universe. Uh, but it is ultimately uh, like redemptive. It's not, um, you know, it's not a downer, the whole thing. And it's it's action, there's lots of space fight scenes. And if you, you know, if you enjoy, you know, space fighters and, you know, kind of imagining how that could work out in the future, you know, that's, you know, that's what it has. It's a hard science fiction. Our audience is going to love this one because that's right up our audience's alley. Space fights. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's yes. us. Yes. So, I think that's Although I'm, fantastic. Oh, I'm sorry. Ahead, I, I'm doing something right. I'm doing something right now that is a little more upbeat and hopeful. Um, I'm I'm live blogging the Artemis One mission to the moon, imagining that a guy had stowed away on board, and so. The, the Artemis the Artemis one it's like this fantastic project because they spent billions of dollars building this spaceship it's completely ready to go in every way it is a mm -hmm. complete spaceship and they're doing it as a test launch because you know when they add up all the figures it's a little too dangerous to send mm -hmm. men aboard it but they've got like a mannequin on board and so my my character he swapped out the mannequin he's in this he's in the mannequin suit wearing a mask you know yep. and just like sitting there prone until they launch and then like haha i've done it uh so it's it's following the mission so um every day i'm releasing another chapter of it following the day's events of what actually happened aboard artemis but um from the perspective of this stowaway uh so it's like semi-fiction um but you know it's it's funny it's hopeful it's light uh no you know no dark depressing you know doom and gloom uh but you know problems and excitement as well that's so awesome that uh, so are is your plan to actually release it as a book eventually or are you just going to drop it on instagram are there other platforms that you've dropped this as well yeah, uh, Reddit, Instagram, uh, I, I set up a Wattpad, which I never had before, uh, but, you know, just figure, you know, get it out there. Um, 
But uh, I, I don't really plan on making it into a book. It was always just meant as like this thing of the moment, right? Where, you know, this mission is happening live now. It's a complex mission. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening with it. And this is kind of a fun way to kind of learn a little bit about it and kind of, you know, put my writing out there a little bit and show people, you know, how I kind of blend hard science fiction with uh, fun. And it's it's a throwback to Charles Dickens, right? Like release, keeping people wanting more and just releasing it a little bit by a little bit, but more of a futuristic setting. So I love that. Oh, thank you. Switching gears a little bit, talking about social media. Before we recorded, you were talking about how you're, you're trying to get used to Instagram. Do you find that you've had to be on social media more thanks to having to market yourself and your, your novels? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, um, participating in social media in a different way, right? Like, you know, I, I've got like, I, I, I happen to like Reddit. I'm a long time Redditor, used it for many years. And I've got like my burner Reddit accounts where, you know, there's nothing with nothing with me on it. And I can mm -hmm. just, you know, I can just have conversations with people on Reddit. And if someone says something nasty to me, I can say something nasty back and then go, oh, that was a mistake. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. Um, but it was so witty, how could I not? But no, like, you know, but you interact with it in a different way, right? And and then when you when you put your name on something like my Reddit my Reddit handle for my writing is author Nathan H Green. Mm -hmm. When you put your name on it, you know, when you're you you know you're putting it out there in the public, yeah, you're interacting with it completely differently. I mean, even Facebook. Like I grew up in this wonderful age of Facebook where everyone was so innocent about it, and mm -hmm. you just did whatever you wanted on mm -hmm. Facebook, and you had fun, and there were no consequences, and it was you know it was nothing. Um, and, and now, like, suddenly, you know, like, it feels very much more like it sticks around. Yeah, and ironically, I met you on Reddit, and I realized when I was going back and forth with you, I was on my burner account when <laughs> I was talking to you. <laughs> and so now I've exposed my burner account to one person, but at least I, I trust them. What subreddits do you find yourself on your burner account trying to troll the most often? Which ones do you like having a, a dialogue and a discourse back and forth on? I, I never troll. I've never, I've never once trolled, but I'm, I am by my nature, kind of a, an extreme thinker, you know, like mm -hmm. you tell an engineer, you know, like, you know, rule, you know, here's a rule and the engineer goes, okay, well, what happens at zero and what happens at infinity? Yeah. <laughs> and that's the same thing as lawyers do, right? Like, well, what happens if, uh, so, you know, that lends itself to, um, to controversial thinking and it's you know it's not that i've got any you know dastardly beliefs but like if you know if if you want to play around with an idea on reddit someone's going to assume you're not you know like you you can say let's play around with this idea what if and they'll go how could you think that and, mm -hmm. and you go, no no I, I didn't think that i i said let's play around with the idea what if <laughs> like i'm yeah. not saying it like so that's, you know, one of the uh, one of the things in law school, everyone thinks the way I do in that sense. But uh, on Reddit, it's a it's not all that. Uh, it's, it's not mess. ubiquitous. Yeah. <laughs> it's like being on Twitter. Reddit reminds me of Twitter. I know this is most social media as in general, but it's so divisive and so black and white. And you can make a statement. It's immediately taken out of context and then people start fighting over it. It's incredible. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I wonder if people don't, um, enjoy finding that as well, where, mm. you know, there's like a little bit of intentional, you know, like, oh, well, you know, I could read it in a charitable way, but I'm going to read it in a really uncharitable way because, you know, I'll, I'll just enjoy that more. What a great point. And I feel like, especially as working professionals, you have to have on this professional face every day and all day at your work and the way you email, even though we want to say, screw you and emails or per my last emails, what means screw you. <laughs> I, I feel like it can sometimes be a relief to see that going on on Reddit and on Twitter as, as detrimental as it is. It's like, oh man, finally a space where people can just say what they're actually thinking in their head. I don't think this is positive. I'm just saying sometimes it feels like, oh, finally people saying what they want to say. Yeah, I've never been terribly good at self-censorship. Uh, and so, you know, it makes me, makes me a little bit more outspoken in my personal life, but... Um, I I, uh, I, <laughs> I fortunately don't have to tone myself down very often. I just, you know. Yeah, it works for you. It I have for me. two more questions for you over here, Nathan, unless um, MK, okay, unless MK wants to add anything else. Um, one question would be if people 
want to reach out to you and have a conversation about your writing, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Yeah, probably on Reddit. Uh, like I said, my my username is uh, author Nathan H Green, um, and I'm always happy to talk with people. I uh, I enjoy it, and you know, it's it's really rewarding to engage with people who are interested in writing and uh, uh, and you know, even more so my work. But you know, I like yeah. I, I just like science fiction generally. So yeah, my last question is: as an aerospace engineer and as a human being, what do you think about living on Mars? Well, it's like, it's the dream, right? And and Musk is right that if we're gonna have a future as a species, it means getting off Earth. Like, you know, you can't have, yeah, so, oh, okay. So <laughs> let, let me start with, with this, this kind of controversial idea here. Nothing is sustainable. Like mm -hmm. th there's this idea of sustainability, mm -hmm. bill of goods absolutely nothing is sustainable you can't have a, a system that just goes on and on and on yeah. uh you can have it go on a long time you can have it go on a million years or five million years or whatever you want but it, you know eventually you get to the end of that clock and then it's done yeah and um i i mean either the system is to expand or the system is to stay as it is and then hope that one day when you get to the end of the clock, the system somehow changed. But, you know, I don't think if society stayed the same way for a million years, it's it's liable to change just because, you know, we're getting to the last box of crackers or something. Like, you know, I think you lose something along the way. And um, I mean, even if it's the people who have to innovate, I mean, even if, you know, you're just not making engineers anymore because you're not letting them do cool stuff. And like the engineers want to big, build big rockets. They don't want to just, you know, repair the machines that make the same pipes that their grandfather and their great, great, great grandfather was using. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Like that, you know, you know, like you'll have a guy who's a pipe machine repairman do that. So, you know what, people aren't going to learn engineering. And once people stop learning engineering, you learn, you lose knowledge along the way. Um, and even if you try to preserve it, it becomes incomprehensible and you need, you know, decades to, to you know, get up to speed. So um, the idea that we can just stay on Earth, no, we can't. Like, no, we can't. Uh, not if we want to make it out of the next couple of million years. And if we're going to expand off of Earth, when are we going to do it? Like, probably around now, right? And, you know, if you look at like the history of exploration where, you know, like you have like these Christopher Columbus figures, never mind that, you know, n never mind what kind of man he was, but like he set sail for the new world based on two mistakes. He calculated how, how the circumference of the world and he thought it was much smaller than it actually is. Mm -hmm. And then he calculated the distance to, uh, to Asia and he calculated as being much longer than it actually is, meaning he could go the other way and he only had a very, very short distance to cover, right? Because he overestimated this way and he, he underestimated, the, you know, this way. And he, he, should, he ought to have died. He yep. ought not to have made it. He just <laughs> yep. ran into a continent right where he needed it to be. But if you look at, you know, the east coast of the United States and you measure that distance all the way across the United States and then all the way across the Pacific Ocean, that's how wrong Christopher Columbus was. And, that, and he should have died somewhere in there, you know, probably, you know, probably in the mid United States. So, you know, that's when we actually go exploring like when we're you know kind of at that level where we can just barely maybe do it but it'd be a really stupid idea but we're going to do it anyways and you know maybe you know like if elon musk got onto a spaceship from mars and he died halfway there that would be like par for the course about how humanity operates yeah like the the first guys who went to the north pole bunch of them died first guys who went to the yep. south pole bunch of them died like and and in in retrospect they died like stupidly where you'd look at it and you go well of course that wouldn't have worked you know why would you why would you think that horses could get you to the to the south pole you need you know you need sleigh dogs everyone knows that well that guy didn't um and so yeah like w we're going to start doing this it's going to be you know it's going to be in the near ish future like it might be another you know 50 100 years or something like that 
and people are gonna like die along the way trying probably um yeah. and people are probably gonna die there you know trying and you know in kind of seemingly dumb ways but like that's how we that's how we actually expand out and that's how we do it and if we weren't doing that we probably wouldn't ever wind up getting there like we'd probably just you know spend so much money and effort trying to make it totally safe and totally mature and totally understood technologies that we never actually take the step and it would be an insurmountable hurdle yeah that's so true like it's going to be trial and error and there are going to be so many people that don't make it and probably stupidly i mean let's be real <laughs> But, um, but like, I, I mean, I, I like totally volunteer to go and do that and die stupidly trying to do something like that. Would like you, that's, you would do it? Oh yeah, know? for sure. Oh, for sure, for sure, for sure. And, and like, you know, even, I, I, I mean, at what risk point, like if you, if you say, listen, you've got a 90% chance of making it. I, I think most people are, well, most people, most people who are interested in space and stuff. They're going to be on board for that. But yeah. you go listen. You got a fifty percent chance of making. You got a you got a thirty percent chance of making. You got a fifteen percent chance of making it. Ooh. I bet you'll still crew that mission, no problem, at fifteen percent. Like people I'm will out. do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out. Um, right. Everyone so, will have their different pain point, but like you'll yeah. you'll find a crew. And those were the guys. You know, those were the guys who went on the ship with Christopher Columbus. Like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I did have one last question for you. Do you have any uh, a What's your best piece of advice for an aspiring writer? So, um, can I have like three pieces of advice? Oh yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, so, uh, piece of advice number one, the first million words are practice. That's like stolen straight from Stephen King. It's absolutely <laughs> true though. Um, and, and a million words is a huge number of words and um the the one good thing is it includes editing and that's you know like something you should be doing but um you know when you're writing like your third book or something like that and you've like you're you or you've not written before and you're going like oh man i should go and do this um you're not even going to know how bad it is because you're not going to have like the sense of taste and mm -hmm. and like it's like any other skill you try to you try to learn along the way like the first time you know you go off to university or college or, or move out on your own and you've got to make dinner for yourself you're not making a good dinner like mm -hmm. it's it's going to be <laughs> horrific um <laughs> But you'll enjoy it because you're hungry, right? So yes. it's it's the same it's the same thing for writing. And as you as you write more and more, and as you kind of like, if you set a million words as your goal, you'll start to see like, oh wait, you know, yeah, I'm I'm seeing how like how much better I was than that stuff I was doing earlier. Uh, I'm seeing some of the problems with my writing. I'm seeing like areas where I have to focus and, and practice. Uh, and by the time you get to the end of the million words, you're saying, okay, you know what, actually I'm, I'm, I'm competent at this. I can, I can put together a sentence. I can write a plot that makes sense. I, you know, I, I understand when my characters are working and when they're not. Um, and, and, you know, that's kind of, you know, being professional with it. And, uh, that's, you know, kind of what you have to do. Um, second, uh, piece of advice, um, develop some kind of like, social media presence and some kind of like ability to sell books yeah um you know because you know it's going to take you a long time to develop the writing skills to do that and i just kind of ignored the social media aspect and just like <laughs> do, 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 do. i will i will just get you know practice writing and it's what i enjoy da, 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 da. Uh, and now you know like i i find i have to make up for lost time there whereas if i was you know kind of building that up slowly over time it would be much easier and you know it you know i'd have I'd have a hundred people I knew who would be advanced readers and, and mm -hmm. read it and write reviews and, you know, like fantastic, you know, that's one less thing that I have to do. No, now I have to, you know, spend, spend time cultivating, you know, that, that list. Okay. Um, so, so develop, you know, develop that so that once you do have a book that's worth buying, you've got people who want to buy it and read it. Um, and the third thing I'd say is um, edit. And, you know, just try to deliberately get better at what you're doing uh, because that's one of the fastest ways to improve what you're doing. If you're just pounding out words, but you're never kind of reading them and going, oh my God, I suck. I hate this. Why, why would I have written it like this? Like it doesn't even work. Like that's the kind of thinking where you're gonna like actively improve your craft. 
fantastic words of wisdom from Nathan and also ironically sounds just like starting a podcast. <laughs> you could apply yeah. those three pieces of advice to how we started the <laughs> podcast. Editing was very important. We sucked the first couple times. We had to figure things out. So thank you so much for your words of wisdom, Nathan. We really appreciate you joining us here on What's Up Grimes. Guys, we will be back with more content later next week. Otherwise, we'll see you guys soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.